We're continually being bombarded with news about what's happening in global markets, and there are many theories as to what the drivers are of those markets. So in this video, we're going to concentrate on leading indicators, which at least give us some idea of what's going to happen in equity markets in the future. Now, if you do want to learn about investing, why not join our Pension Craft community? It costs just $10 a month, and you'll find a link in the description below me and above me. So now let's look at those leading indicators for equity in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. So let's start off with this perfect predictor I've discovered, which tells you exactly what stock markets are going to do one year in the future. Well, of course, there's no such thing. And whenever we think about these indicators, bear in mind that none of them is perfect. None of them are even near perfect. So really what you have to do is gather many of these indicators together and see what kind of a picture they're making overall. And even then, we still don't know exactly what's going to happen to equity markets in the future. So these are all just a guide and they are not infallible. Probably one of the most important things to look at is valuation. In other words, you compare the price of an index with the profit which it generates. And you can either average the profits over a decade, in which case you get the CAPE measure, or Robert Schiller's cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, or you can just look at the earnings over the previous year, which is here denoted PE1. But unsurprisingly, when equities are very expensive based on this measure, which is when we find ourselves on the right-hand side of this graph, then the 10-year returns following that very high valuation tend to be low. And when valuations are low, in other words, equities are cheap by these measures, then usually the 10-year return following that low valuation tends to be much higher. But notice there's huge variation in these returns. So again, this is a far from perfect predictor. But what I've found is that when people are telling you that valuation doesn't matter anymore, that's usually a fairly good signal that valuation matters more than ever. And at the moment, US valuations in particular are very high indeed, which in turn suggests that the returns we'll see over the coming decade will probably not be great. The credit market is a fairly good leading indicator of what's going to happen with equity. And a really good way to get a handle on what's happening right now with credit in the US is to look at the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey on Bank Lending Practices. And because that's a bit of a mouthful, most people call it the Sluice Survey, based on its initials. The latest one, published in July, was based on data from 75 domestic US banks, but also some US branches of foreign banks. And in what follows, you'll see the initials C and I, which refers to commercial and industrial loans. And the key question to look at is whether it's easier or harder for a company to get a loan. And if we look at the July data, the SLUS survey showed that credit conditions tightened. In other words, it became more difficult to get a loan. And that was true for firms of all sizes, small, medium and large. The respondents also said there was weaker demand for those loans. Presumably, if the goods and services of a company are in lower demand, then a company will cut back on its loans because it no longer needs new loans, and it probably wants to avoid taking on too much new borrowing. What was also quite unusual in the July survey was that every sector showed tightening. That includes commercial real estate, but also consumer loans and real estate. So clearly banks are concerned that the rate of defaults is about to increase, which, given what's going on in the economy, is completely understandable. The SLU survey tells you what percentage of banks are tightening their loan standards. And if that number's positive, then that means that credit is harder to come by. Or in other words, credit is tightening. If the number's negative, then that suggests that banks are easing their credit standards, which means that it's easier to get a loan. What I've done here is superimposed the annual returns of the S&P 500 in red. And what's interesting is that when we have easy credit conditions, when this number's negative in blue, that tends to be periods when we have very good equity returns. But during this period here, you can see that the credit conditions were gradually tightening. But equity returns were still positive at this point, just after 2000. But not long afterwards, 
we saw the equity market start to sell off, and this was the bursting of the dot-com bubble in 2001. Then we had a period of easy credit conditions when equity markets performed well, but then again we started to see credit conditions tightening leading into the financial crisis, and then we saw equity markets sell off. And in the last decade, we've had a very easy set of credit conditions. And of course, an equity market rally that goes hand in hand with that. But after the pandemic, we've seen two quarters of very severe tightening of credit conditions. If we zoom in on the period after 2018, you can see that in a bit more detail. Notice how the SLU survey looks quite blocky because it's only published every quarter. But you can see that successive tightening in the last two quarters very clearly along with that equity rally. Now, of course, this isn't a perfect indicator, but it does show that credit conditions are at odds with what's happening in the equity market. And this is already starting to have an effect on US corporate bankruptcies. So if we look at the largest companies, which have more than a billion in liabilities, you can see that 2020 started slow, but then it went above the defaults in 2002, and then it broke through the default rate in 2009. So what we're already seeing, despite intervention by the Fed, is a very rapid pickup in defaults for large companies. And that's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So those are the indicators which I usually look at, but there are many others out there. As you can see in this tweet from Zero Hedge, which refers to 19 indicators which the Bank of America Merrill Lynch has created for the US equity market which it calls its bear market signposts. In the media, you see how many of those signposts are currently flashing red. So here in October 2018, 14 of the 19 indicators were suggesting we were going to get a sell-off. And in this update, you can see that 11 of the 19 had been triggered. Now, I don't have data for all of these, but we can look at some of them. The most obvious one is a federal funds rate, which is set by the US Central Bank. And the indicator here is that when the federal funds rate goes 0.75% above its lowest point in the previous business cycle, which I've marked with this dashed red line, that's the bear market indicator. However, that one's unlikely to flash red anytime soon. As Fed Chair Jerome Powell said, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. And that'll remain true while US unemployment remains so high. Another easy indicator is to look at the 12 and 24 month returns on the S&P 500. The 12 month returns are on the top panel and the 24 month returns are on the bottom panel. And the indicator here is when this 12 month return is more than 11%, which again is marked with a red line, and when the 24 month return goes above 30%, which is the green line. You can see at the end of August in 2020, the 12 month return has just gone into danger territory but the 24-month return is still well below its threshold. So you could say that that signal is just flashing amber. Another one which tends to spook markets is when the US yield curve inverts. What that means in practice is that short-term interest rates are bigger than long-term interest rates. And here I've compared the 10-year Treasury rate with the three-month Treasury rate. Now notice that there was a double dip here just before we had the recession. But of course, the double dip wasn't the cause of the recession, that was the pandemic. And currently, because Fed rates are so low, it's unlikely that the yield curve will invert again. But it isn't too far from that inversion. Another bear market indicator is the level of the VIX index of implied volatility. And the threshold here is a value of more than 20%. And you can see that since the sell-off in March, when VIX peaked above 80%, the value of volatility has still remained high even though we've seen a very sharp rally and the value of VIX is still above that 20% threshold, but only just. And finally, we'll look at the rule of 20, which is a combination of valuation, so you look at the trailing price to earnings ratio for the S&P 500 and you add the rate of inflation. Well, in fact, you don't need to add inflation at all because trailing price to earnings, according to FactSet, are already at about 22. But if we were to add inflation, it would add just 1%, taking us to 23. So as we said at the beginning, none of these indicators is perfect, and none of them by themselves gives us a perfect predictor of what's going to happen. But it's notable that many of them are still flashing red, but certainly not all of them. 
So it seems as if we still are vulnerable to a sell-off in the equity market based on several of these indicators. If you do enjoy these videos, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. You'll see a link on the far right-hand side of this page. And you'll also see how to sign up for our free weekly market roundup, where we talk about what's going on in markets, but also talk about how economics is affecting markets. So, as always, thank you for listening.